Now Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura. Yesterday, he addressed his state's Reform Party convention, which was held at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul. In the speech, he looks back at his first six months as Minnesota governor and talks about the future of the Reform Party. This event is half an hour. Now I would like to introduce the man who really needs no introduction. He ain't got time to bleed. Our governor, Jesse Ventura. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As I look out here, it looks like we're growing, doesn't it? I like that. Uh, it was almost, I guess, one year ago, wasn't it, that uh, we were at the North Hennepin Community College, my old alma mater of one year, where uh, that day we uh, kicked it off really solidly and moved forward with a uh, with a uh, campaign that I, I, I'll always remember, they said we couldn't win. And we certainly did win. And I, I want to take the opportunity to say naturally that I can't do it without help, as I said that day. You know, it takes a united cause, a united party like the Reform Party, and a growing party to move forward. And uh, we took the big enchilada. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and we're moving forward all the time. I think, you know, in both of the special elections, and I'm speaking off the top, I have no written statements today, you know, no prepared speech, which is what I enjoy, because I think very strongly when you speak at a Reform Party gathering, uh, it's not a gathering necessarily where you need written speeches and written statements and all of that stuff. I think you can kind of go off the top of your head, and that's what I love about the Reform Party. But... Uh, you know, we had a couple special elections out there, which I thought we did tremendously well in, because, you know, special elections are not the prime place you can win at. It's a tough place to win, being a third party or a growing party. But I thought that both our candidates did exceptionally well. We got excellent uh, uh, results in those elections. Certainly, we didn't win them. <clears throat> but we let them know very strongly we're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to remember it takes patience. I think all of us, you know, maybe <clears throat> felt when I won that there was this uh, maybe false feeling that somehow now it was going to be a magic carpet ride in. Well, I think in a way these two special elections continued to give us a wake-up call that it's not going to be easy, that it's going to require work from the very grassroots level all the way up to the top to achieve what we want to achieve, and that is give us a three-party, major-party system here in the state of Minnesota. But we stand at the brink right now. We stand at the brink. If we get focused in the year 2000, we can become the power brokers of this state. And I say that meaning that it doesn't take a lot of seats. If we can capture a half a dozen, we will be at the brink because that's how close the two major parties are. And at that point in time, they would have to look to us. And rest assured, after six months over there, I'm beginning to learn how the system works. <laughs> <laughs> you, you learn that, uh, you know, the things that I talked about over there are true. They are true. It is a poker game. Everybody here pretty much knows, I think, most people ought to play poker. You get a card dealt, then the whole card that you keep down and no one sees that one. And then you get dealt four other ones in order around the table. And gambling takes place as you receive each of these cards. And it very much holds true over there in the legislature. It is a poker game. The problem is we, are, we the people, are the chips. We're chips. And 
It's interesting to watch it unfold over there, how everyone who gets elected in the two major parties talks about working for the people, working for the constituents, until they get there. <laughs> then it's no longer the constituents, then it's party caucuses. And they're working for two party caucuses playing poker until the very end. And it's remarkable. You know, I had to laugh when, uh, a little bit when the session ended, of course, at I think around 11.58 on Monday night, you know, two minutes before the, uh, the bewitching hour where maybe they all turn into pumpkins. I don't know <laughs> what, ha what happens after that. But they end that session and then it all, you know, the bills come filtering to me over the course of the next week and a half. And of course, I'm given the opportunity to pull out the veto pen and line item veto. Now, people must remember now on a veto, you cannot veto policy. You cannot veto uh, uh, in, a, in a line item veto, I'm speaking line item. You can't veto a policy. You can only veto something that comes with this, money. So uh, they're very good at manipulating and creating bills to keep the line item away from you in that manner because it's got to have a money attachment to it. But I found it remarkable how everyone, it's a unique situation, everyone talks about cutting down government, everyone talks about cutting down taxes, but then when it gets to nitty gritty time, don't touch my piece of the pie. You know, cut everything else but the one that affects me. And I found it also interesting that getting all these bills at 11.58 when they did finally reach me and I line itemed, that I then got accused of being unfair, that they didn't have a chance to respond to my vetoes. <laughs> and I sat back and thought, well, get your work done two weeks ahead of time. Don't play poker. <laughs> and... <laughs> And you'll have plenty of time to respond to my vetoes in whatever way, shape, or form you want to do it. But we accomplished a lot over there, and I think the thing I want to speak to you about today, one of the things here at the Reform Party Convention is patience. We have to remember, you can't change the world overnight. That is a big, huge piece of machinery over there. It's a, like a gigantic wheel, and I've said this many times, you know, if you're going to stand in front of this wheel, you're going to get run over. What you try to do is get on board that wheel and attempt to make those changes along the way and change the direction of that wheel. And I think we're doing that right now. We're doing it in many ways over there. First off was initially out of the get-go, they accused me of not being involved, not being connected, not being part of what was going on over there. And, you know, when they make statements like that, it goes out through the press, you know, to the public, and the public, of course, will believe it. You know, they all sit and, oh, what's the new governor doing? He's not involved. Rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, from day one, we were completely involved. It's just my difference in management or leadership style of how I'm involved. I'm involved in a way that probably was different to them this year. At least I hope it was. They had a Reform Party governor. So we want to make sure it's different. But my management style over there is I believe in selecting commissioners who are experts in their field. And I openly say experts beyond my expertise. In other words, they know more than I do about their particular field. But it is my job to coordinate the whole big picture but allow them, and my management style is simple. You get good people to do their jobs, put them in positions to do them, and then step aside and allow them to do it. And I think that's what we're... I think that's a lot of what's missing today, is you're getting too much control centered on just one or two minds. It would be like us here being controlled by just two or three people up here. We're not. I certainly hope we're not. We want input from all minds, and I think it works like that over there, allowing good people to do their jobs. And it was funny because uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, an author named Richard Marcinko, the Rogue Warrior. 
and I picked up his latest book a couple days ago called The Real Team. And he writes these fictional books now about his teammates and team members of when he was a Navy SEAL and all this. And this time he actually brought the live people into this book to explain how they got to be where they were and what it was like working for Commander Marcinko. And I was amazed at how alike Marcinko and I are in our leadership. Dick Marcinko, when he would prepare for a Navy SEAL operation, many times very clandestine, public and all that don't know about what they do, he simply turns to one of his people, tells him what he needs to have done, and it ends right there. That person then takes the initiative and goes out, brings back the results to his captain. And that's Marcinko's brand of leadership, which I found amazingly similar to mine. So maybe it spawns out of both of us having been enlisted men going through Bud's training, and it spawns out of the fact that neither one of us wear underwear. <laughs> you know, maybe that's the key to it. We're not restricted in our thinking. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, it, it was a, a remarkable thing for me to read this book and realize the parallel between Commander Marcinko and myself and the style in which we govern. And uh, I couldn't be happier over there with the session. I think the big thing we showed through this session was that tripartisan government works. It worked, and it worked well. And it. It was a tough job, but yet it was an oxymoron at the same time. In many ways, it was easy. You know why? Because we've introduced that new word now, centrist. Centrist, which I think kind of means common sense, and it kind of means sitting in the middle where you're able to take the best ideas from the right, the best ideas from the left, and you kind of sit in the middle. And going back to the whole poker game, that's what made me in a great position to sit and play poker. Because eventually, the far right and the far left, when they come to compromise, have to meet where? In the center. So I was able to sit at the table and realize that when it got down to all the cards were there and you know your whole card gets turned over and you play your hand, that eventually they would come back to where we were at. And I think we accomplished a great deal over there. Uh, I, I, I want to give you a little insight. I believe that for the most part, elected officials from both of these parties and, and the whole system over there, they come in with good intention. They really do. They are people like you and I who get elected and want to go over there and make a difference and feel that you can. But I think the big problem lies in the system. The big problem lies over there of what we've allowed the system to evolve into being today, where they get gobbled up into these two-party caucuses, this power struggle that goes on over there, where you must get in lockstep. You must get in lockstep in line with your party caucus in which to carry any type of power. And therefore, you have to give up your individualism in which to be at all successful. Now. I think that there's a way to solve this problem. And I think it's a way that we in the Reform Party need to focus and work at, but we also need to be very careful in how we do this. And the way, I believe, is unicameral. I believe very strongly. And I've had many people, you know, there's pros and cons to it. I've had people saying, Governor, why do you want you in a camera that could kind of take some of your power away, maybe? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But again, there's no perfect setup for unicamera. We have the ability to create it the way we want to create it and to put in the proper checks and balances if we do it right. Uh, I believe it's the answer uh, somewhat in the future because of the fact that it will eliminate these conference committees because that's where the dirty work happens. It, it will also force much more debate to take place and votes to be taken place out on the open floor, which is, which is, it's simple. 
As an elected official, stand up for what you believe in and vote for how you believe. Rest assured, though, you're not going to please everyone. That's one thing you learn very clearly when you get elected. There is not one decision you will make that will not upset someone. Someone won't like it. By the same token, someone will. It's, a, it's an easy give and take. But again, though, we have to be careful, and I, and I say this very serious, it's easy to applaud unicameral and to say initially it's a great idea, but how we set it up is going to be extremely important because we must set it up to ensure that third parties are not omitted. We have to be careful because we want to survive. We, the Reform Party, we, the third party movement in the state of Minnesota. So we must be very careful as we progress forward that unicameral isn't being used to shut third party politics out and keep it to just two. And, and we have to be, and, and I've got my staff, uh, I sent uh, some of my people down to Nebraska already, and I've been briefed on an initial report on unicameral, but we will continue studying because it's a bold move that will change the shape of Minnesota government forever if it happens. Now, I say that with some caution because out in the private sector, of course, we're going to need a strong movement of unicameral in the private sector. You can't accomplish this just over at the Capitol. It's got to be a, you know, because what does it require? We don't have initiative and referendum here, which, you know, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. It's hard enough to get people out to vote. You know, what are you going to do, put 20 things on the ballot to make them decide? And not only that, but it works against a representative style of government. You, you elect people to represent you. But... Uh, uh, we need to be careful because out in the private sector the movement is building but some of the people involved in the movement cause me concern. Well, yeah, there's a few people involved in the, in the unicameral movement that I think we absolutely need to keep our eyes on. One of them used to head the Republican Party, Chris Georgicus. Need I say more? <laughs> <clears throat> so, we must ensure that as this movement of unicameral starts to gain momentum, that it gains momentum with a feeling that is inclusive to all political parties, not just shoving out and getting back down to just two and making us back to a two-party system, because I think we'll all agree we've had enough of the two-party system. <laughs> I think that's why we're here today. But uh, anyway, we'll move to a, a lighter note. Uh, I'm having fun. It, uh, it's a challenge. There's nothing more that I would rather be doing in my life right now at my particular age. Uh, you get up around 40, I'll be 48 next month. You can't do all those things physically you used to do. So you have to change, I think, as you get a little older and accept more mental challenges. And uh, that's, that's what I'm doing now is accepting more of mental challenges. It's, you know, it's a lot, in some ways, it's like the game of golf a little bit. When you're young, you go out and you play golf and you're physical and you smack the ball, but you, f you hit it long and deep and you fly all over the place, right? And you don't score that well, although you're impressive when you strike the ball. It's just where the ball lands. Now as I get a little older, I don't quite hit it as far. I play a game that's more under contained game, and I'm scoring better because I'm keeping the ball in the fairway more. And you start to learn it's not necessarily how far you hit that golf ball. It's a lot easier to hit it a little farther on your second shot than to be chipping out of the woods with a long first shot. So uh, th that's the situation I'm in right now. I'm enjoying it, but I will tell you this. Our work is not done. We can't sit on our laurels of winning governor. We can't do that. Frankly, I'll tell you why. I'm lonesome. <laughs> I'm, I am now challenging you 
and waiting for the year 2000 when I can stand at that Capitol steps and greet a number of new Reform Party candidates who will walk in and fill those chambers in the House and the Senate over there. And again, we don't have to change the world in one election. All we have to do is continue to chip away and get our message out there. One good example was the city of Brooklyn Park where I was mayor. It took us, now you just have a mayor and six council people up there. We busted our butts, but it took us four elections simply to get a majority. Four elections just to get a majority up there in Brooklyn Park. And imagine what it's going to take with 201. You notice I didn't have to say 202. We got that one. <laughs> but there's 201 over there. And so my message today is that our work has just begun. It hasn't finished. We've just tapped and scratched the surface of what we need and want to do in this state. We need to mobilize. We need to get out there. We need to take our message to the people. We need to make them understand that uh, we, we stand for the open government, that we stand for the honesty. Uh, the thing that, I, that I'm most happy for is the fact that our rules in the Reform Party, we do have a few, but I think they're very common sense rules. And what I love about the Reform Party is that the Reform Party doesn't make you adapt to it, where the other two parties do. You have to change who you are to become part of them. What I love about the Reform Party is you can remain an individual. You can remain with ideas of your own. And certainly, we sit here, many of us will differ on our ideas but yet we sit for a common feeling of that all ideas are good and that we're not going to change or make people narrow down their thought process to become part of our party. And that's what we need to do out there. And the big key to me, the one, the one solid value that we must keep in this party is the not accepting special interest money. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that is the one thing that will allow us to always be that breath of fresh air over there. That is the one thing that will allow us to make decisions based upon what we believe in and not because we owe someone. And I can tell you real clear, it's the one thing when, when we get candidates, and I say that when we get candidates elected over there, it's the one thing they will totally love is the fact they don't have to waste their time meeting with lobbyists. I, I truly enjoy that. I haven't met with a lobbyist yet. Uh, I don't anticipate meeting with any. Because it's simple. If I meet with one, I got to meet with them all. To be fair, right? Well, I don't have time to do that, to meet with all them. But I will say this, that my staff will meet with lobbyists at times because sometimes they come up with ideas. And as we've said very clearly over there, don't bring us your money, lobbyists. Bring us your good ideas because we will open the door to good ideas. And I don't think ideas necessarily have to come with a price tag attached to them. And so we, you know, the word lobbyist is not always a totally bad word if it's met with ideas, if it's a lobbying idea rather than a lobbying paycheck or a lobbying get you elected money thing. So, uh, I just want to finish off today by saying let's keep the faith, let's keep working hard, the job has just begun. They're stuck with me for three and a half more years minimum. <clears throat> we, uh, we're seeing a great movement there of many more reform people sitting in 
positions to make differences. There's reform people on my staff. There's reform people being named to committees that I get to name. Uh, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take you to volunteer. It's much the same as, as when you name a staff or, or create whatever. You can't do it without people applying. I can't go out and search for you. You have to come. You have to want to serve. You have to put yourself in a position. And believe me, it's tough. I'll warn you now. It's very hard. It's very difficult. It's a job that you have to undertake and understand what you're going to face. And as you climb higher into it, the obstacles become more. You lose your privacy. Your family can lose its freedom for that period of time. So you have to undertake it knowing that it is not a walk in the park. You'll be put under scrutiny. I'm enjoying it today immensely because we're under scrutiny now. The reporters are here. And today I say hooray to them for coming. Let's give, in fact, let's, let's give the press a round of applause for covering the Reform Party. I'll have to be a little nicer to them. We need their help. We need to get the word out. No, we appreciate it because we're a movement that's on the rise, will continue to be on the rise. I'll finish off by saying God bless each and every one of you. Keep the faith. Keep working. We need to focus on the year 2000 because we need some wins in 2000 and we can get them. It's ripe for it. We need good candidates, solid candidates with a lot of support out there from the party. If we get that, we can be victorious. We can keep building. You don't build a building from the top down, even though we kind of did it this way. <laughs> we, we got a little out of sync, but that's all right. But when you... But when you look at it, it helps to have the top to build the foundation. <laughs> but we all know that when you build a building, you build it from the foundation brick by brick up. And now we've accomplished the top. Now it's a matter of building that foundation. So I'll finish like this. No election is unimportant, whether it be city council, whether it be a county commissioner, whether it be a state rep or a state senator, whatever it might be out there, we build a strong party by winning the little victories. Because the small victories, anyone will tell you, in a combat situation, wars are won by the small victories. They're won by the individual battles and skirmishes out there. And that's the way we have to build our party. We have to win the small victories, take each one as the victory that it is, and continue to build that foundation and build the strength of the Minnesota Reform Party. Because as far as I'm concerned, we're here to stay. Thank you. One second. Before the governor goes, I, I need to um, give him a few little trinkets. Um, and, and I need to say this, and this is from my heart, and I don't have prepared um, notes. And, and, and be quite honest with you, I'm not prepared at all today. So. Um, Join the club. That's how we operate. <laughs> we think from the top. And the governor made a comment just a few minutes ago about we have started from the top and we're building our foundation. Well, actually, maybe Minnesota is building the foundation for the, for the nation, and we are starting from the bottom. And this is our foundation, and we are looking at it. Um, but that's my personal opinion, and, and um, I'm hoping yours too. Um, I also need to say that in the 70s, they talked about um, silent majority. Well, I, I believe that, and, and they said that some party out there gave the silent majority um, recognition. I believe that our governor is giving us and continues to give us a voice. 
and I think he speaks very strongly for us all, and I really appreciate that, and I want you to know that. Um, I have some gifts. Right, Just for you. you. Hold thank on, you. hold on, hold on. Thank you. That thank is for you. you. Okay. Let's see a Skivvy's check. <laughs> All reform? All reform? I do it, but the press is here. <laughs> 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 well, Isn't that a great picture? You know, I should be smiling a little, though. I think. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a little too, too. Uh, Serious there, I think. We all, we in the Reform Party, we work with a smile on our faces, <laughs> always. And Governor, um, at the, those times when you're at home alone with Terry and you're saying to yourself, how in the world did this all begin? Up oh, the, the video, <laughs> how we shocked the world. Well, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. You're welcome. I would, you. I would like to say one more thing, too, if I may. Before I leave today, though, I would also like to uh, say a thank you to Diane Goldman, who, uh, it, absolutely, you know, yeah, thanks to Diane, thanks, thank you to all the people in the party that have worked so hard, because rest assured, you know, being a leader of a party is not always the greatest job in the world. I mean, it's a lot of headache, it's a lot of hard work, and, you know, in the Reform Party, you're not going to get some big paycheck for doing it. And so I think we owe Diane a, a, a thank you for, for committing herself from her family, which is what it always takes to do these type of jobs. And, uh, you know, thank you very much, Diane, for a job well done. Uh, for keeping this group in line, you know it's a big job, you know, the, the up and down. But again, thank you to Diane Goldman for a... And again, and thank you, Reform Party. We march on.